Hello there guys, it's Joey. Uh, this video is going to be about the Celtic goddess Epona and some items that I was requested to create and we actually had not one but two requests for Epona this week and I was like wow, um, we've never had any requests by we, I mean me, myself and my hands um, for Epona before and then this week there were two. Uh, so it's a bit like buses only with horses. So there you go. So I have done some research about the goddess Epona, having not worked with her on a personal level. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that uh, research that I did and a little bit about sort of the very quiet interactions from this particular goddess. Some, uh, there was very quiet. It was very interesting to me. I'm wondering if it's because we're going into the dark half of the year and she feels more like a light half of the year goddess. I'm not sure. Um, or if it's just her way of being gentler and sort of softer and in the background a little bit more. So Epona is the great mare. She is the horse goddess most associated with the Gauls, the Celtic Gauls. Um, there is very little information available as most of the Gaulish Celtic myths were lost. Uh, and most of the myths that we do have come from the British Celts, which is documented by monks, Christian monks. The Gauls, however, did leave a rich legacy of inscriptions and monuments to do with the goddess herself, statues and so on and so forth. Firstly, so before um, we read a little bit more of the interesting information that I came across upon my research with uh, this goddess. So when this happens, which it happens a lot with the Celts because a lot of the mythos was not written down because writing uh, sacred word down was kind of seen as detrimental and taking the power away or it's been lost or it's been destroyed or it's been changed and altered or got rid of in one way or another that gives us a big gap in information and it's quite problematic which means that we are educatedly guessing from what we do have and unfortunately when what we do have is recorded by Christian monks there is an agenda, there is a bias, there is a reason for them doing it. Some of it may be salvageable, we might be able to read between the lines and uh, see things for what they might have been seen as from the Celts uh, but it becomes problematic and a little bit of a guesswork involved. So the origin one of the origins of uh, Epona comes from the late Greek writer Aegisilius, who wrote that Epona was born of a mare and a man, Philonius Stelos, who chose to spurn womankind in favour of a beautiful mare and mated with her and gave birth to a beautiful and lively daughter who she, the mare, named Epona, and Epona became the goddess of horses. The giving of a name in most Celtic legends is of vital importance in that individual's future. The naming of Epona by her mother implies the mare may have had a divine nature herself and that Epona followed on in some way from an earlier horse goddess. It's really A weird and B interesting in terms of uh, mythos and origin story. So, um, we have the suggestion here that the great mare was divine in nature and it's not unheard of in um, different mythos from across the world to find um, the mating of man and animal or the crossbreeding of um, particular men and animals and then you get things like from the Greek, you get say minotaurs or centaurs um, and mermaids and, and so on and sirens and things where it's all different animals that are sort of half animal, half human and uh, they take on attributes of both and it's usually to do with some kind of divine interference. So it can be very telling about a particular myth when this comes up and I'd be interested to know why he spurred womankind in favour of this mare, but that's not included. So uh, we have to kind of guess. Um, bad luck with women? I don't know. Um, but there you go. Um, often, of course, um, many mythos stories become hyperbole. They become um, sort of unbelievable or odd or unique scenarios. So... Um, she was often found in stables in terms of her statues and they were often garlanded with roses. She was associated with the cornucopia, a symbol of land and fertility. She was seen as carrying keys and accompanied with birds giving 
possible underworld connections. The Uffington White Horse is maybe the largest monument to Epona left in the British Isles and she is thought to be linked to sovereignty, fertility and the land. She was invoked on behalf of the Roman Emperor implying a link of some kind to rulership and horse symbolism which is a recurring theme of sovereignty. She's the patroness of all journeys, physical, mental, emotional and spiritual. So the land connection is probably best known on my channel for talking about um, with regards to uh, Macha and the who has is associated with horses and has that uh, sovereignty tied to the land energy to her. And again with it being a horse goddess and a Celtic horse goddess there is a solar aspect to the goddess Epona and I feel that this often shows up within terms of sovereignty like the rising of the sun the rising of a king or a queen and that solar energy does often come in a sort of uh, when it's more to do with land and sovereignty and the legal sovereignty with whereas moon energy seems to be more about magical sovereignty and, and the magician and mystery and things of that nature I shall just wiggle myself around because it's not comfortable down here excuse me there we go Ugh. physical journeys <laughs> There you go. Um, so that's a little bit of information that was available about the goddess Epona. Again, you know, when you come into contact with goddesses that you haven't necessarily um, interacted with on any personal level whatsoever before, which I have not, um, it can be an interesting experience to really try and figure out where that particular goddess fits in terms of an energetic level, a spiritual level, when you're trying to connect to um, what you feel best suits honouring her in terms of physical items when you've been asked to spiritually create them for somebody and as part of their path. And they did have one sort of um, request with the pillar being a lighter colour and their second lady, um, I'm still working through your other pillars because um, pillars take a little while and uh, they have to be dried properly before you move on to the next stage. So the pillar is light and the pillars are both the same. Um, so this is the Epona pillar. And when she came through, there was this, this sort of beigey horse energy. And I initially was considering white, but white felt a little bit too cold um, and a little bit too on the death energies for me. I associate with white with death a lot of the time. And the horse image that came through was a little bit more of a warmer bay, uh, sort of a car you know that warm toffee caramel colour that horses can come in and they have very light manes? That energy. And the energy was very, very warm, very, very gentle, very, very subtle, very subtle, very subtle. I'm used to dark goddesses coming in and like, this is what I want, and this is how it will be, and do this, and this herb, and this flower, and this was not that at all. This was softly, softly, gently, gently, and it was very, very horse energy. It's interesting to me because obviously horses have been with humans for a long time in a friendship and in a working relationship sometimes. They've, you know, along with dogs, I think they're perhaps the oldest animal that has come with us and they have tended the land with us, they've gone to war with us, um, they've travelled with us and there is that, oh, it's almost making me want to cry, there is this very deep connectivity um, between horses and humankind and when they're treated lovingly and with respect, which I think, I mean fingers crossed for the most part, a lot of horses are, you know, unfortunately people are dicks no matter what, what unfortunately, um, but for the most part I think there is a grave respect between man and horse and there's this intelligence and this connection on a very soul deep level between humankind and horse kind and I think that that came across very strongly when working this path, this mutual respect. There was definitely a travel element, a physical, emotional, spiritual travel element that's uh, keeping on through life in a very adamant way. Um, st not stoic but strong and the feeling of you know them always having your back and always loving you and always being there and being 
there for you in terms of horse energy. What is that? Oh, okay, something. <laughs> I just heard clunk out the corner of my ear. Right, so the pillar itself is a warm, light beige e grey. And then the top has this, this beautiful pale shimmy. I hope you can see. There we go. It has an almost land feel to it. It has almost a tilling the land and um, wheat and grain feel to it. There's a, there's a warmth, a strength. It's, it's very... It's very difficult for me to put into words. It's, it's a bit like an energetic hug. It feels very much like a support system, if that makes any sense. Then we have the smudge, which there's a little rose right in the center for decoration. There's no rose in the actual smudge because um, it's basic smudge 101 that rose petals don't smell good when they are burned. Oh. It's, it's a right. It creates the temple of Epona, this smudge, and the temple of Epona is warm open fields, uh, wheat, grain, the land, the, the the connectivity between man and land. There's an honest okay. I'm being told there is an honest relationship between man, horse, and the land, and when all three work together, it becomes almost a spiritual exercise. Wow, okay, that was more information than I got the whole time creating it. It matters now. Alright, okay. Um, and that connectivity between man, horse and land is a sacred bond, a sacred trust. And when it is done in such a way that that relationship is honoured, then all three mutually benefit. There is a spirituality between them. There is a honour between them. Whew! It's very calming this as well, very calming. So we'll just pop the rose back in the centre. The rose is there for decorative purposes. So take it out before you burn it. <laughs> and then we have the two oils. It was requested that I create two oils, right? Let me... Yeah. So I wanted the two oils to uh, look alike but not be the same because they are both for a pona. So this one is the Great Mare. Epona goddess oil. Look at that. Look at the light going through there. Hello. She got right on that. And that's very much about her. That's about her goddess side. That's about um, honouring her in terms of the great mare. Um, it's very much about celebrating Epona. Um, the garlands, the statues, that sacred bond, that energy. And then the other one is the uh, sovereign energy of the land and fertility. So this honours her relationship to the land in terms of sovereignty and bringing forth solar horse energy into that element. So this has a more sovereign based energy whereas this has more of a goddess energy and hopefully you can see that they are similar but not the same. And last but not least is the spell cauldron. It's just gorgeous, I really like it. Right, so that is a video discussing briefly the goddess Epona, the goddess of horses uh, from the Celtic mythos, as well as showing some of the items that were requested for her. And for the lady who is pillars, that one is done. The others we're working through, we're getting there, me and myself and I. And that's it. Many blessings.